Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Deborah Gilpin, President and CEO of the Children's Museum of Phoenix, which was recently named among the top 10 children's museums in the country by Parents Magazine. Debbie joined the museum after serving as Vice President of Exhibits and Programs at the Arizona Science Center and as Executive Director at the Discovery Museum in Massachusetts. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Debbie, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, children's museums run the gamut of just being completely uninteresting to being completely wonderful. It's, it's one of those those fields where you have this incredible range in quality. Mm -hmm. Talk about your museum and talk about what makes a children's museum a wonderful place. I've been in the field of children's and science museums for about 25 years. And initially at the uh, Discovery Museums in Acton, Massachusetts, at that time there were about 100 children's museums in the country. Now there are over 300. We serve more visitors than science museums serve. And the interesting thing has been that in this 20 years, um, all these museums opened up, and they opened up because people had passion for what was needed for young children in their communities. So every museum is a very unique combination of the community, the people who uh, grabbed on and helped make it happen, the dreamers, uh, the kind of knowledge they were able to obtain from the rest of us, existing museums. We like to say we play well in the sandbox together. We share information. We help new museums come along. Uh, I serve on the National Board of Children's Museums, the Association of Children's Museums, and one of the threads that we began 20 years ago was just for emerging museums, just to help them know what they needed to know to become a great museum. And I'd have to say that it's one of our top uh, strategies in the coming next three years We've begun a new initiative called Reimagining Children's Museums that we've just launched really to get at this very question of why is there such a wide um, diversity of quality in children's museums and what can we do to help bring up all of them? Because it's, of course it's a disservice to the great museums to have ones that make people think, why do I want to go to a children's museum? But uh, on the other hand, there have been some wonderful museums that have now stretched that vision and, and that really is what Phoenix has done. The folks who started the Children's Museum of Phoenix way back when, the first visionaries of it, toured the country, went to dozens of museums and paid attention to what they liked, what their children liked, what they didn't like. They did very uh, disciplined research into what was working for a museum and that became the basis on which this museum was built. From there, we were able to really sprinkle in the fairy dust, I guess, is how we talk about it, um, that that fairy dust is kind of what children bring to it. It's really being child-centered. It's looking at uh, what is a child going to do with this and how can that be managed and supported in a positive way, not in a, oh, they're, being, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. My staff likes to call me the uh, most badly behaved eight-year-old boy because I tend to, I test everything. I push the limits on what are kids going to do with it. Don't put it behind plexiglass. Find a way to let them play with that object because obviously the point is they want to get at it. Right. So use that as a positive quality. And I would say that's a key thing that we did here in Phoenix, which was to find um, true ways that kids put their things on real objects. Nothing is behind plexiglass. Uh, we don't have signs telling you what you can or can't do. That's another key philosophy. Many museums, as they mature, I think this comes along, is they, they fall into the didactic teaching mode of saying, what do we want to teach about? So we want to teach children about diversity. So let's make a diversity exhibit. And there's a place for that. But in our role, we said, well, let's be diverse. So we have 13 different languages are spoken among staff. We hire for that. Books in the museum are available in 24 different languages. The foods in the marketplace are real containers from foods from 20 to 30 different languages on any given day. So that a child picks up a box of tea in the grocery mm -hmm. store and it might be tea with Arabic language written on it and they think, well, wow, that's weird. I'm, I've never seen something like that. But the other child says, wow, that's what I have at home. Right. I'm welcome here. Right. This is a place for me. 
Well, in a visual arts museum, the objects are the center, and the objects were donated or purchased, and then the museum is built around those objects. If you look at a natural history museum, there are collections of natural materials, and the museums are built around those objects. In this case, you're talking very much of a visitor-centered experience. Those visitors mm -hmm. are, are children who wish to go on a journey, whose parents wish them to go on a journey, but that journey is not predefined. Is what you're saying is that you're, you're creating a context for the children to define their own journey? Absolutely. We're setting the stage in a way that whatever way they want to go with what intrigues them, it's ready for them. It so will what you don't do is, is, is as important as what you do. Absol oh yes, very much so. That, that, that's a very good point about it. Well, you'll note that children's museums are the only kind of museum that's named for who visits, not for what we're teaching, science or art or natural history. And that sets the tone right there. I think our goal in the coming years is to make sure we don't lose that, to make sure that as new exhibits are imagined and programming as well, that it stays focused on being open-ended, that there's no right or wrong answer. It's very tempting as adults, we often tell children what success means. We identify what the goal is. And I'll just describe, we have a, a room for building forts. It's fabric and cones and crates and sofa cushions and uh, and really we see kids in here working at trying to solve a puzzle of building a structure that they love and they want to be in and climb in and cozy in just like we all did at home and they when they get it to work right they are so empowered there's they feel that success they own it they know that they were able to solve the problem they laid out for themselves and the ability to do that really plays into adulthood. So many of the things that kids experience in our museum are about helping them experience it so that it builds into their personal experience so that as they grow into adults, they have had those experiences. So is this about the children's ex exploration, empowering them to, to design, empowering them to build, empowering them to learn, Children have this really natural way of approaching things, which is to play with it, and their curiosity takes them right into it. So we don't need them to define what they're doing, but we do want to lay in front of them things that take, that require different ways of solving it, so that they get to experience and don't get cubbyholed into a particular way of looking at things. Uh, some exhibits take a very strong approach. Um, we have an exhibit called Noodle Forest, which is swimming pool noodles that hang vertically from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. and That's a, kind of a scary thing for some kids. And we talk a lot about risk. We want kids to experience risk when the stakes are low so that they understand, how do I go about making a decision about this? Do I go faster? Do I call for help? Do I cry? Do I wait for help? And what will my adult do? So all those pieces come into play for a child. All of those things come into play when we're adults, too, when we go to attack a problem at work or in our home life. So we want kids to experience these challenges. Some exhibits really invite you to slow down. If you approach them too quickly, they stop being successful for you. Right. We have a sandstone tabletop that kids paint with water on. If you take water and you just smear it on this whole thing, it's, it stops, it, it no longer provides you any additional feedback. So we watch kids who visit repeatedly and we love the repeat visitors because we see children ratchet their own learning. Every visit they bring back something else that they experienced outside of the museum. And because we've designed exhibits in a certain way, they can come to them and try the next new experience. So they may, the first time, smear that water everywhere. Well, the next time, they're not going to they, do that. They do it differently. That's right. So we see this kind of uh, choices that we want children to have a lot of tools in their toolkit 
about how to approach things in life. And that's what we try to do is lay out and stage those experiences. Give us a sense of the scale of this, of, of this museum. Oh, sure. Um, the Children's Museum of Phoenix is a building of 75,000 square feet. It's a beautiful 1913 National Historic Landmark with columns and, and just all the things you'd imagine of a, what you'd think a museum used to look like. Right. We use 55,000 square feet of it and we serve about 300,000 visitors a year. So we just served our millionth visitor after three and a half years. And we have a budget of about $3 million, 70 paid staff and hundreds of volunteers. $3 million budget, mm -hmm. and you serve 300,000 visitors annually. Right. And right. you have 70 paid staff mm -hmm. and hundreds of volunteers. Right. That's quite a statement. It's uh, quite an operation. For, it's quite an operation. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's been really interesting because most organizations start small and mm -hmm. then bec move into a bigger site right. or build a building. We didn't do that. We went straight to the biggest building in town, and, and uh, which was crazy, but really was clear that it was needed in Phoenix. And the proof has come through that it, we were right to do that. The market's there. The need is there. Uh, it's just a very, very joyful place. And I don't think the various populations in the region, in the valley, had one place to go to before where they could just be together. I had a father the other day tell me that he visits the museum with his three-year-old so that she can learn how to be a friend. And that social development piece we take very seriously. We look at every, every exhibit and program for what are we teaching about how you behave with others, kindness, turn-taking, but not, again, not in the way school teaches it, but in a very just consequential way, logically consequential. If you do this, this kid might run you over and then you need to solve that. And we want to model for parents a, this kind world where we can all get along together. Are your visitors uh, a, a very diverse? Usually we hear three or four languages every day in the museum. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're very diverse. It's one of the things people tell us they value about it, um, and, and diverse in all ways. Uh, we give away 50,000 passes a year for free access to low-income families, kids with special needs, and that really results in every day kids experience children who don't come from their same neighborhood. Right. And it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity and obligation, we feel to help them with that, to help them embed those feelings that we're all equal and we all have this great potential and your role in life is try to find your potential. How do you fund your, your uh, budget, your operating mm -hmm. costs? Well about 70% uh, of our budget comes through earned income, so earned income. tickets and memberships and then the last uh, just under a million is raised through contributions, really a vital portion. It's what it's what makes the difference with being able to do special programs and to give this kind of access to all visitors. The best part that I like where a, a piece of income comes from is parties. So we've had three people get married in the museum. We have uh, proms every spring. And what I love about that message with proms is that teenagers really love the museum. Not if there's a five-year-old in it, right. but when they're in there themselves, they are still children and they will still play. And adult parties, it's the same way. As long as the kids don't, as long as the little ones aren't there, it's a, <laughs> they have Becomes a, an adult playground? It does, it does. We have, we have uh, holiday parties, we have martini parties, all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, it's great fun. Well, that's, that's terrific. And, and how did it come together? Um, you, you referred to the fact that you started off in this large building. You started off basically opening up as if you had existed for 20 years. Right. But the process to get to that point was a much more extensive process. Uh, talk about how the community leaders uh, came together to decide that, that, mm. that this need existed and then to fund that need because there was no earned income to, to no. get it off the ground. Um, this group took, this museum t really took about 10 years to get off the ground, which is, which is long in the norm of opening children's museums, but not outrageous. There are some who've taken more. Um, really, the initial group was an incredible grassroots group of activists who 
secured the attention of the leadership in the community. So, for example, at the time, Mayor Gordon was a councilman. Mm -hmm. He got on board the idea of this museum. One of the ways they helped people understand was they were able to secure a bus that, uh, that we gutted and put exhibits in, and it traveled all around the valley with this hands-on exhibitry. And it was a way for us to say, this is different, might be different from anything you've seen before, but look what joy and what experience your child is gaining. Come in and help us do this. So it truly came out of all parts of the community coming together to make this museum happen. So you create a, a, a traveling museum mm -hmm. in a bus, mm -hmm. and you're going to the different schools? Is that, to is that schools, what you're doing? To schools, but mostly to, to community festivals. Okay. So, and one of the, the best parts about that is th at a community festival, we were often one of the only ones that was really hands-on for kids. Right. So people would stay and stay and play, which is exactly what we wanted. And it was a place for us to prototype exhibits, to test things, to see how are they going to hold up. So you're piloting this at a modest cost, mm -hmm. and you're seeing what your audience response is. So you're also right. gathering evidence to right. make your case if indeed you end up being successful, because it could have failed. Right, People absolutely. People could have been completely mm -hmm. disinterested. Your exhibitions mm -hmm. could have right. just been dry and, and uninteresting. And we're spreading the word about what the experience of a museum is. Right. And in Phoenix, this was interesting because so many people come from elsewhere that they had prior experiences. And just going back to our conversation earlier about they may have an experience at an excellent museum like right. Indianapolis Children's, or at one that's not so good. Great. Yeah. Well, Indianapolis is the grandmother of them all. Right. So that's our, <laughs> and the largest. It's, um, it's huge, and it really sets a model for what's possible. But the other, the other, another piece that I think we do, I alluded to it before, is the risk taking that we do. We know children take risks, and we need to invite them to and to experience it. But as an organization, we agree to take risks as well. We are not risk averse. That shows up in some very concrete ways. We worked with artists a lot throughout the museum, and part of this was to set an aesthetic that's beautiful, that makes adults and children enjoy being there. And I think we succeeded at that very well. But what it means when you work with artists who are not experts in learning or children's activities, uh, it, it takes trusting them to, on their piece of it, but also informing them and being able to articulate what is an eight-year-old boy going to do with that and how do we build that in so that it's still successful. So we worked with fabricators in the museum. We had developed the designs, our team, and we worked with fabricators who had never built children's museum exhibits before. We wanted to be local. We wanted them to be free to use their best artistic and craftsmanship that they had, which they did for us. It was a really a work of love for all of these fabricators and continues to be. And then it took our expertise in what the functional experience with those exhibits would be to keep them on track with that. So were you building a fort like your children do, except you were actually building a museum? <laughs> yeah, were you, exactly. Were you actually exploring that together and a lot, opening yourself to challenge and, Absolutely. and needing to get along with people who had different expertise? Yeah. So you're actually modeling the way you function. Even before you establish the museum, you are modeling the behavior that you want to encourage in the children. And you've landed on something we talk about. We still talk about that as that's what we want. When we, when we are developing social skills in children about how to work together, how to deal with problems, we want to model the best behavior as leaders, as staff. We very much adhere to that principle. The other piece in that um, that's been a great pleasure is we think of every staff or volunteer, every person who's involved in the museum as bringing a special gift to the museum or to the world, but to the museum that will enrich it and make it be a richer museum, a, more, a deeper, um, more interesting museum. And so we work hard to tease that out from all of our staff and volunteers. And we apply that directly to every child who visits has this amazing potential that we want to help them bring out. And we want to help their adults learn how to bring it out too. We do a lot with parenting. Um, teaching parenting, modeling parent behaviors. That's an area that we will definitely push more into in the coming years. Parenting. Mm. 
you go where angels fear to tread. <laughs> well, I think so many things, so many times parents, when they're learning new things about being better, better parents, they can be intimidated or they can say, oh, I've already messed up my child. But really, uh, some of it is so fundamental. And we also have new research that tells us really critical things, that simple things that parents can do, just the difference between talking to them, the amount that a parent talks to a child, is directly correlated with the size of vocabulary and the level of education that, that a child will grow into as an adult. Are you positioning yourself to be a resource for parents who are interested in creating learning environments within the home? We are, both parents and adult caregivers. We're seeing a lot of early childhood educators come in and look at our spaces to figure out what they could do at home. And is this also a place where you'll bring parents together in the way you bring children together so that you can have the, the sharing of knowledge yes. and the sharing of experience? It seems like your whole approach, whether it's from the point of, of building the museum, conceiving the museum, going into building the museum, um, opening the museum and having children come together, um, and now the idea of having parents come together, the whole approach is about encouraging self-instruction, self-exploration. And, and you create this sort of safe space, whether it's a virtual space to test out ideas, mm -hmm. take some risks. Mm -hmm. Well, a safe emotional and physical space is one of, the few, one of the things we don't get very often in our society anymore. So to have a place where you know your child will be safe, where you can play with them, is very fundamental to a healthy relationship. One of the things we'll see is um, a, a parent, typically the father, who's very gruff and not involved with the children, or the, you know, they're really having trouble with their relationship. By the end of the visit, they're all laughing and giggling together. And they, we think of that as we send them back out into the world from a stronger place. Right. The next time they visit, a month later on the next free night, they come in laughing and giggling. They start at that place. And it's such an honor to bring that kind of experience to a family. And they probably, I mean, they may think of it as a great visit, but they, may, they don't need to recognize in how many other ways it has helped them in their family. But that's a key role we have. We know that first-time parents, it's a lonely, it can be a lonely place to be a first-time parent. Yes. You need to talk to other people going through the same things. You need to know there are resources out there. And what we, we've noticed is that uh, they really talk to each other. People who don't know each other talk to each other when they're there with their first child. We specifically designated a large area of the museum to be very young child only. It's three and under. And then in every theme room, we have a baby zone. Mm -hmm. This commitment to the zero to three, zero to the five, zero to five age is unusual. We consider it very precious. We pretty easily understand what school age kids need, and it's very easy it's for us to say, let's do that program, or let's do that program, or let's have the teenagers do this. And every time we do that, my role is to say, well, how will that pull resources from the young child piece? Right. Just because fewer of us understand it, all the more reason we need to attend to it. And that's one thing here that I think we're being very recognized for, is that young child piece. But it's very needed in Phoenix. How do you interact with other institutions, schools, uh, preschools, um, other uh, museums? Mm -hmm. You have referred to a broad array of, of different types of learning, from environmental learning, the sciences, um, architecture, um, there are visual arts elements that you've referred to, uh, music, those kinds of things. Um, how do you interact with with other organizations that are also involved in transmitting information and enriching people's lives? We work closely with many other museums uh, and schools, schools and child care centers, they visit mm -hmm. in that way. But in terms of the other museums, one of the interesting things we did early on was help other museums understand how we are their future population so that young children in a very holistic way, are doing math and science and art and music throughout the museum. It's not categorized. It's there, though. And what we hope is that when they go to 
the next level up when they're older, the science center, they'll put two and two together and realize that some of the things they did at our museum were already science. We can see kids in that fort room that I was describing earlier. We can see kids in the fort room who are engineering their entire fort in just the way an adult engineer would structure and identify what's needed. And so we can see kids' strengths and um, support that. So are you preparing the way for the museum visitors in the, uh, of the future, the, the builders of the future, the entrepreneurs of the future? Absolutely. I have a great story. Um, just before we opened, I think some of the art museum staff had the feeling that because we're hands-on, their experience at the art museum with children was now going to be that kids come in and they want to touch everything. Mm -hmm. And so they were afraid of that, and this is common in the field, in the country. And one of the things Jim Ballinger, to his credit, did <laughs> right away was bring the whole team, 45 people, over to Jim see the museum. Great. And I tell you, it really opened their eyes. And my, one of my favorite things is that we have hanging in our stairwell uh, these fiber optics that hang down, which is an homage to an exhibit at the art museum called Fireflies. Uh -huh. And we tell that to our visitors all the time. Well, if you, because they love our fiber optics, and we'll say, well, if you like that, have you seen that other exhibit? <laughs> and now we just have a great relationship with them. We, we teach ASU classes together on occasion. Our marketing staff gets together. Our educators uh, meet. So at all different levels, we know among the arts and culture organizations that, that we have the whole population to serve. And we each have niches, and we have a lot of crossover, and it benefits us all. Well, this is a wonderful contribution to the community. And I, I truly appreciate uh, Arizona's approach of, of supporting diverse institutions and the cooperation that, that this community, that, the, that Maricopa County has, has exhibited over the years to create some stunning institutions has really been a model for others to follow. Yeah, Debbie, thank you so much for coming and visiting with us, and thank you for your insights. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Mark.